What's up YouTube? Today I'm going to be comparing the 1979 Timex Q with the 2020 Todd Snyder reissue. Obviously there's a lot of similarities between these watches, but there's also a lot of differences. So I'd like to go into some detail and show you what those differences are. I think the most important difference uh, is the seconds hand, and it's not the design of the seconds hand because they're basically identical. But you'll notice on the 2020 it's doing the typical quartz one tick per second, whereas the 1979 has a sweep to it. But they're both quartz movements, so what's going on here? Uh, I'm going to take the case backs off and I will show you what's going on. I'm also going to go over uh, the external differences. Uh, before we go any further, wrist check. I'm wearing the uh, Season G series. My last video was about this watch. I have since replaced the bezel insert, the hands, the crown, and the bracelet. I liked the watch a lot when I first got it, and I, I dare say I love it now. I think these mods really set this off. So uh, let me get the case back off, and uh, I'll show you what's going on inside of this weird watch. So this is the inside of the 1979 Timex Q. I don't think I'm even going to bother taking the case back off of the reissue. There's nothing interesting to look at there, but I will post a picture of the movement. What makes this movement so interesting is that you see it has what looks like a normal hairspring on a mechanical watch, but it also has a circuit board and a battery. When I first saw this, I thought that um, maybe there's an electric motor that turns the gears and it's regulated by the hairspring, but it's actually much more interesting than that. So here I have a uh, stripped down Timex electric movement to show you a better idea of how these work. So your battery goes here and the negative terminal is this over here and it, uh, I guess, sends the negative charge to this coil. Underneath that's a magnet. And then the positive uh, side of the battery goes through this red insulator. And then there's a little wire. Um, it's so thin, I don't, I don't think I'll be able to show it. But it runs in here. And as the balance swings, there's a contact on there. And it hits that wire and makes an electrical connection which I guess makes some sort of uh, electromagnetic pulse and that propels the balance back the other way. So in a normal mechanical movement, you have the mainspring turning gears, which is regulated by balance. And here you have power being generated and being regulated by the same mechanical balance. And then that turns the gears. So I, I think that's pretty interesting. Let me show you um, what else is interesting about this movement. So it's hard to see, but you have something here that looks like a pallet fork. And it's actually very similar to the pallet fork in a mechanical watch. You see it swings back and forth. So as, as this rotor swings back and forth, You'll see there's the little pin there. That's what makes contact with the uh, that wire I was talking about, which you can kind of see right there. Um, there's another pin that knocks that pallet fork kind of thing back and forth. And as you do that, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a gear up here with these sharp serrated teeth. As this thing goes back and forth, it moves that forward, which turns the gear train. So in a couple ways, this works kind of backwards from how a normal mechanical watch works. And uh, I think that makes it really, really interesting. Now, this movement is actually a Timex Dynabeat. It's supposed to be like their more high-end electrical movement. It's like the high beat version. It beats uh, eight times a second instead of six times a second, like most of the electric Timex movements. This movement in the Q is six beats per second, but it's regulated by this circuit board. The Dynabeat does not have that circuit board. So on the circuit board, there's a trimmer capacitor. There's, I believe, another capacitor under here. This is a quartz oscillator. And what this whole thing does, you can bypass this circuit and the watch is still going to run. But my understanding of what it does is instead of the electromagnetic impulses being controlled strictly by the, the hairspring on the balance, the quartz oscillator controls it and 
it makes timekeeping more accurate and it also makes the movement re more reliable because this purely electronic way of doing it, uh, I guess it tends to make sparks between this little pin and this wire and then uh, carbon builds up on there and it can't make contact anymore so the watch doesn't run. By regulating um, the impulses in sync with the oscillations of the hairspring, it's able to uh, apparently reduce sparking. So here's the watch running. It looks like a normal mechanical watch once you ignore all the uh, circuit boards and the batteries. Um, just a quick warning to anyone who has one of these watches. Um, I actually have two of these and part of the reason why I'm only showing one of them is uh, my battery door broke. Uh, these two halves separated. So just a warning, um, if you break it, you're not going to be able to get another one. You'll have to buy like a parts watch to salvage a battery door from it. So my recommendation to anyone that has one of these watches, just leave your battery door on forever and um, swap batteries out by removing the entire case back. So now that that's out of the way, uh, let's look at the external differences. A bit of history about this whole Todd Snyder thing. Todd Snyder is a clothing brand that was founded in 2011. They had nothing to do with the design of either of these watches, but Timex has been reissuing a bunch of their old 70s designs under the Todd Snyder name, like as a collaboration. I'm really thankful that they didn't put any Todd Snyder branding on it because who's that? I'd never heard of that brand until I saw this watch. I think they should have reissued the Q like this and then done the one with the GMT bezels as Todd Snyder, but whatever, it is what it is. The indices, the overall dial design is uh, almost identical. The text on the reissue is a little bit larger and some of the printing around the date window is different. One thing that makes these movements very interesting to me is the date window. So if you look closely, um, it's, not, it's not a square like most date windows are. It's actually a trapezoid shape. I think the reason they did this is because the dial is curved and so if you had a flat uh, date wheel uh, might look weird. So then they did a curved date wheel to match the curve of the dial and I think that um, if all of the numbers were the same size the number on the right side of a two-digit number is going to look smaller than the inside number. So they tried to kind of account for that by making the outer numbers bigger. Overall I find this date wheel fascinating. Like it goes from this weird font for 19 to a pretty normal looking font for 20, back up to a weird font for 21. It's just so weird and inconsistent. I love it. Anyway, compare that to this. It's a, squ a square date window. Uh, I'm guessing that the date wheel is flat. I'm guessing the dial's flat too. It's, it's hard to tell, but I think it is. Moving on to the bezel. The fonts are a little bit different. I think that the reissue's bezel is a little bit thicker. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about both of them is that it's a one-piece bezel. Normally you have a bezel and a bezel insert. These are both one piece. As far as the case goes, the original is like a chromed base metal, whereas the reissue is uh, stainless steel. Both of them have a uh, acrylic dome crystal. The shape is almost identical on both of them. I think there's some differences in the bevel on the case side. Um, both this one, but also this one, um, you'll notice it's it's a bit larger on the original, and the finishing is way worse. Like this might be some of the worst finishing I've ever seen. Whereas the finishing on the reissue is actually pretty good. The bracelets are a totally different design. I'm not really sure what you would call this style. I guess a, a W link. Whereas this is like a straight link with polished bevels and brushed links. Both of them have folded links and a stamped clasp. The design on the original clasp is cool with the uh, asymmetric text. I really like that. Both of them are just your standard stamp clasp. The original has removable links, three of them. The reissue also has a um, bunch of removable links. They have this interesting like raised box thing going on. 
So you just jam something pointy in there and push the, uh, the thing out. The reissue does have quick set date, but it does not have a quick set day. This does not have quick set day or date. However, if you go all the way past midnight to get the date to change, you can wind it back to about 10 p.m. And then when you cross over again at midnight, it will change. So it's kind of like a half quick set, but neither of them have quick set day, which makes them a total pain in the ass to set, especially this one. The gearing for the stem is so low that I think to, to get the hour hand to do a full rotation is something like a turn and a half or two turns of the crown. So you have to just sit there and crank on that thing forever to get the day to change. And then you have to do the same to get the date to change. And so today's Wednesday the 3rd, and I just, I'm probably never gonna set that correctly because it would take me too long and I, I don't care quite enough. Timekeeping accuracy is definitely gonna be better on the reissue, but this is not too bad. Um, I think it's running about five seconds a day slow right now. And when they were new, I think their spec was like 15 to 25 seconds fast a month or something. Like, I think they were actually pretty good when they were new but uh, this one's old, probably has never been serviced. I got it on eBay, put a new battery in it, messed with the regulator a little bit, and it's running good enough for me. So I'm just gonna leave that as it is. Overall, I think both of these watches are really cool, but I think that the original is way, way cooler. And a lot of that has to do with the, uh, the movement. It's just such a weird interpretation of what a quartz movement is, whereas this is actually a pretty bland, boring movement. These they're around, but they're kind of hard to come across. Like I've only seen one sell on eBay in the last couple months. It went for about 200 bucks. These were 180 when new. I've seen them marked down to 130. I think Long Island Watch has these for 130 right now. I got mine for 110 brand new on eBay. Uh, they said there was dust under the crystal. When I got it, there was none. So go figure. I think for 200 bucks, this is really, really cool. I think for 180, this is um maybe not the best value but i paid like 120 shipped and and i think it's a pretty cool watch don't know how long i'll keep it i do plan to keep this one for a long time it's just it's too cool but yeah if you can pick one of these up for 100 bucks used or something i think these have a lot of style to them i just i find quartz movements boring the ticking bugs me i don't know but this weird electromagnetic thing really really cool Anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching.